This is the Crossfire Fast Attack Vehicle and Driver Rumbler. This vehicle and figure set were available in 1987 only. They were discontinued for 1988. The Crossfire is a radio-controlled vehicle, the only one in the G.I. Joe toy line. There were other vehicles that were motorized, but not radio-controlled. You might see the radio-controlled feature as a gimmick. This is not a licensed toy. This is an official G.I. Joe vehicle in the main G.I. Joe toy line, but is it really compatible with the rest of the line? We are going to take a closer look at Rumbler later, but I'm going to set him aside for now so we can look at the Crossfire. The Crossfire was manufactured by Nico, a Japanese radio control car company. Kirk Bozigian and Greg Bernston flew to Japan to arrange for the production of the G.I. Joe RC vehicle. They were shown the chassis that would fit their price point, and they designed the shell to go on on top of it. Guy Cassidy was the G.I. Joe vehicle designer who did a rough sketch of the Crossfire. He noted that the vehicle sat too low so it would bottom out on rough terrain. We will test that out. On the TV commercial, they are careful to only show the Crossfire driving over smooth surfaces. Even though it looks like it's driving over hills and rocks, they're actually pretty smooth so it doesn't bottom out. The blueprints specifically say to avoid driving through sand or water. The Crossfire design is very similar to other Nico radio-controlled cars at the time, such as the Thunder Eagle. The radio control is supposed to have a 70-foot range, and there's a variation. Some of the Crossfire cars are marked with this Delta 49, while others are marked with this Alpha 27. The Crossfire is different from most RC cars at the time in that the Crossfire can hold an action figure driver. Like I said, this is not just a G.I. Joe licensed toy. This is an official G.I. Joe vehicle with an official G.I. Joe action figure that is supposed to be compatible with the rest of the line. The Crossfire is like a beefed up version of the 1985 Awe Striker. The design is similar, but of course the Crossfire is much bigger and it drives on its own. The green and orange color scheme is similar to the 1986 Havoc. The orange is a bit obnoxious, but this was 1987, so G.I. Joe hadn't gone full neon yet. It was only half neon. I don't have a physical copy of the Crossfire's blueprints, but I do have this warranty that came with it, this 90-day limited warranty on G.I. Joe Crossfire vehicle, long expired. But it does warn that this warranty is void if vehicle has been damaged by accident or unreasonable use, neglect, misuse, abuse, improper service, or other causes not arising out of defects in the vehicle's materials or workmanship thereon. Let's take a look at the parts and the features of the Crossfire. Even though I don't have a physical copy of the blueprints, I am using the blueprints for some of the descriptions of the features. I will point out, though, that there is a typo on the blueprints. Number 15 is shown twice, and there is no number 1. So I'm interpreting that the way I think it should go. In the front, we have this black bumper. It's very wide. It goes in front of both front wheels. And attached to that, we have these molded-in headlights, also in black plastic. That's all one piece. The blueprints call these Breakthrough Xenon Headlamps. The plastic bumper, it's called a Desert Spec Ground Effects Airfoil. Interesting that it is a Desert Spec Airfoil when the Crossfire is not colored for a desert environment. The front wheels have black rubber air filled tires with Bridgestone stamped on the side. They are on white hubs. On the underside there is this white switch and that is for front wheel alignment so you can adjust the alignment on those and of course they will steer with the help of the radio control. Those front wheels are attached to independent spring suspension so we've got some shock absorbers for those front wheels. The body is in green plastic. It's a light green but it'll still pass as an army vehicle. Even though this is similar to an existing Nico radio controlled car, it has a lot of details you would expect to see on a real G.I. Joe vehicle. I would credit Guy Cassidy for adding those details. There is a Delta 49 sticker on the nose, and as already mentioned, there is the variant for the Alpha 27. They are also color-coded. The Alpha 27 is red and the Delta 49 is blue. Other than the Alpha and Delta stickers on the front and the sides, the 
other stickers appear to be the same. There are two side-mounted machine guns, one on each side. They will pivot a little more than 180 degrees. The blueprints call these spinner side-mounted auto-load 9mm cannons. There is a running board on each side, and they have a texture pattern, and each one has a foot peg, so you can peg an action figure on to ride on the outside. The running board on the starboard side is a bit smaller to make room for the recharging port and the on-off switch. It has asymmetrical stickers on the side. It has a larger Delta 49 on the port side and a smaller Delta 49 on the starboard side, again to make room for that recharging port and the on-off switch. This is a recharging port if you're using rechargeable batteries, which I am not. As far as I can tell, the Crossfire did not come with a cable for this. You would have to supply it yourself from your own rechargeable battery kit. The power switch has two positions, on for when the vehicle is in use and off for when the vehicle is not in use to conserve battery power. The Delta 49 variant has a black switch and the Alpha 27 variant has a red switch. Around the cockpit there is a black armored windscreen with very thin viewing slots. The cockpit has a molded in seat and a center control panel and a couple joysticks on the side. No steering wheel. It also has this orange piece with hooks that go over the action figure's shoulders to hold the figure in. To put the figure in you need to bend his knees and you do have to kind of wrestle him in there but once he is in with those hooks over his shoulders he will not easily fall out. There are some molded in vents on the sides above the back wheels and there is a radio receiver antenna on the port side with a clear plastic sleeve to protect it. There should be a red triangle RC flag on the antenna that's missing on my Delta 49 variant but I do have it on my Alpha 27 version. At the back there is a spoiler still molded in that green plastic and on each side of the spoiler there is a peg so you can peg one missile on each side. The Crossfire includes two of these orange missiles that peg onto the vehicles with these dumbbell-shaped slots, very much like traditional G.I. Joe missiles, again suggesting this is supposed to be a real G.I. Joe vehicle. The blueprints call these Livewire SAM-19 missiles. SAM means they are surface-to-air missiles, but they are mounted like surface-to-surface -surface missiles. There is a large machine gun mounted at the center of the spoiler. The the whole assembly is orange. There is the machine gun itself, the mount, and these hard sights, which is a separate piece and a frequently missing part. The blueprints call these Pumper Twin 20mm cannons. There are two large barrels and lots of technical detail. It has the two sights and four grips, so I guess two figures can operate this at the same time. The machine gun can elevate and rotate 360 degrees degrees, so very good range of motion on that machine gun. I just noticed the tips of those barrels are hollow, so they will sort of take blast effects, even though they're not really made for that. They will sort of work with it. At the very back we have this black platform with a texture pattern and two foot pegs. So again you can peg an action figure on the back to ride along. I guess you could put two figures on there but I would suggest just one because those pegs are pretty close together and the guy riding on the back can operate that huge machine gun. Finally we get to the back wheels. The back wheels have black rubber air filled tires with studded treads all all over them. Like the front wheels, they are on white hubs. It looks like the motor is directly above the axle for the rear wheels, and there is a spring suspension system for this whole rear assembly. Next to that motor, there is a white switch, and this is for two different speed modes. For the left, it is in power speed mode, and to the right, it is in high speed mode. The underside of the Crossfire is in black plastic, and we have the battery compartment. There is this white latch, which you can turn to the side to open it up. The battery lid is hinged so you won't lose that part. That's nice. And it takes six AA batteries. Finally we get to the controller. The controller is in black plastic. It has a long wire antenna with a white tip on it. The sides are textured so it won't slip out of your hand. There is a sticker indicating if it is the Delta 49 or Alpha 27 controller. This is the Delta 49. On the back there is a removable battery 
battery cover, and it takes a 9-volt battery to operate. There are two control sticks on the radio controller. The one on the right moves from side to side, so that controls the turning. So push it to the right to turn right, push it to the left to turn left, and it will automatically recenter when you release it. The control stick on the left will move forward and backward, so that will control the forward and reverse movement of the vehicle. So you push it forward to move forward, you push it back to move back, and like the other one, it will center when you release it. I am outside to test out the crossfire. We had some bad weather lately, so I've been waiting for the ground to thaw so I could do this. Finally, we have good weather conditions, so let's see if this thing actually runs. I want to test it on smooth, uh, smooth surface and on rougher terrain. I also want to test it in power speed mode and high speed mode. So let's see if we can uh, get this thing going and uh, see how it does. Okay, uh, this is in power speed mode. So this is supposed to be the lower speed and we're on a smooth surface. So let's check this out. So now we are still in power speed mode, so I'm going to now try to drive it over the grass. Um, this is not the roughest terrain, but if it can't make it over the grass, then it's not going to make it over anything rougher than that. So let's give it a shot. Ready? Go. Yeah, that's exactly what I thought. And so Guy Cassidy is right. The thing is set too low. Uh, to ride over rough terrain. It's really got to be on a pretty smooth surface. That was in power speed mode. Now let's switch it to high speed mode and see if we can tell the difference. There we go. And I'm going to do this on a smooth surface because as we saw, there's no point in trying this on a, on a rough surface. Even short grass is too rough a surface for this thing to go. There we go. High speed mode. That was the crossfire in power speed mode and high speed mode. I did notice it went faster in high speed mode, but it does set too low to go over rough terrain. Even short grass is too tall uh, for this thing to ride over. So it works well, but it does need to be on a pretty smooth surface. Now let's look at Rumbler. His name is similar to the Transformer Decepticon Rumble, but no relation, I'm sure. The prototype code names for this figure included Motorface, Downshift, Overdrive, Long Gone, and Scrambler. The Scrambler code name was used through pre-production, but didn't make it to the final production figure. Rumbler was only available with the Crossfire. He was not sold separately during the original run. Rumbler is made entirely of reused parts from earlier action figures. This figure was made about as cheaply as possible, but it's now considered a rare figure, so it's expensive and difficult to find on the secondary market. Rumbler was repackaged and sold at the 1993 G.I. Joe convention, but was misnamed Footloose. He was packaged with 1989 Recoil's accessories. Let's look at the accessories that came with the original Rumbler, starting with his weapon. He has this submachine gun in light gray plastic with this hanging strap. That strap is a little bit delicate. I do not put this in the figure's hand. This is a reissue of the submachine gun that originally came with 1985 Heavy Metal. The strap is broken on my Heavy Metal submachine gun, but that is the same submachine gun in a different color plastic. The next and only other accessory is the helmet. The helmet is in brown plastic. It is a reissue of the helmet that originally came with 1985 crankcase in gray plastic. Same helmet, just 
a different color. There was another brown crankcase helmet packaged in Battle Gear Accessory Pack number 5. In fact, it may be the same helmet as the accessory pack. Let's take a look at Rumbler's articulation. Even though he was made up of reused action figure parts, he had the articulation that was standard for G.I. Joe figures in 1987, so he could turn his head from left to right and look up and down. He could swing his arm up at the shoulder and swivel at the shoulder all the way around. He could bend his arm at the elbow about 90 degrees. He could swivel his arm at the bicep all the way around. This was an O-ring figure, meaning the figure was held together with a rubber O-ring that looped around the inside, so he could move at the torso a bit. He could move his legs apart about so far. He could bend his leg at the hip about 90 degrees and bend at the knee about 90 degrees. Let's take a look at the sculpt design and color of Rumbler, and here's where you may have deja vu because there is nothing new on this action figure. On his head, he has sandy blonde hair and a sandy blonde mustache and eyebrows and sandy blonde eyes. They didn't even bother to put his eyes in a different color than his hair. This head was originally used on 1985 Footloose. On his chest, he has an open jacket over a gray open collar zipper shirt. It looks like he has a white undershirt under that. On that jacket, he has a triangle patch and a pocket. On the left side, he has an unpainted pistol and holster with an unpainted strap that goes across the chest and over the right shoulder, an unpainted strap that goes over the left shoulder, and those straps meet in the back. This chest and back piece were originally used on 1985 Heavy Metal, but on Heavy Metal, those unpainted details are painted and they look much better. The arms feature long brown jacket sleeves. There's a pocket of some kind on the upper left sleeve, and he has green gloves. Again, this is a reuse of the arms from Heavy Metal. His waist piece is in tan plastic with an unpainted belt with unpainted pouches on the side and back pockets and a silver belt buckle. This waist piece is a reuse of the part from 1985 Bazooka, but of course Bazooka has more paint. His legs feature tan trousers with large pockets on each of the upper legs. He has green boots with some straps around them. Not a lot of detail on those legs. These legs, once again, are a reuse of parts from Bazooka. For once, he does not have less paint than the original. Let's take a look at Rumbler's file card. Yes, he did have a real G.I. Joe file card. It has his faction as G.I. Joe. It has a portrait of Rumbler here, taken from the artwork on the vehicle box. His code name is Rumbler. He is the RC Crossfire Driver. His file name is Earl Bob Swilly. His primary military specialty is Fast Attack Vehicle Driver. Secondary military specialty is Armorer Small Arms. I don't think his arms are that small. His birthplace is Rayford, North Carolina, and his grade is E4. This top paragraph says, Rumbler's future as a revenue agent was cut short by his propensity toward high-speed car chases through the piney woods in pursuit of moonshiners and tax stamp dodgers. After totaling seven government vehicles, it was thought to be in the national interest for Rumbler to transfer to a branch of service equipped with sturdier vehicles and dedicated to the pursuit of individuals and organizations less inclined to sue the government. The second paragraph has a quote. It says, What you do is sling Rumbler and his crossfire under a heavy lift chopper and drop them on the run from 20 feet up, 50 miles behind enemy lines. Sort of like dropping a weasel in a hen house. You know you're going to see some feathers fly. Finally, this last section says the name Earl Bob Swilly does not identify any known living person. Well, that contradicts the rest of it. This disclaimer is usually printed on the vehicle box, not on the card itself. Even though this is a throwaway character, this file card does seem like it was written by Larry Hama. It has his flair. Rumbler sounds like a character from the Dukes of Hazard. Larry had some fun with this one. Looking at how the Crossfire and Rumbler were used in G.I. Joe Media, the Crossfire was only animated for commercials, and as far as I can tell, Rumbler was never animated. In the G.I. Joe comic book published by Marvel Comics, a character called Rumbler appeared in issue number 80, but he is mislabeled. It's actually Armadillo, the driver of the Rolling Thunder. They just mistakenly called him Rumbler. The Crossfire does not appear in that issue. The Crossfire without Rumbler did make an appearance in the comic book in issue number 131. In that issue, the Crossfire was used as a remote control car with no driver. That is a very meta use 
use for the crossfire. It's also remarkable because that issue is from 1992, well after the toy was discontinued.